Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome, uh, a very big uh, and warm welcome to London and Scotland's Buzz in Review. Um, we're, we're delighted to have you here, um, and we're going to be sharing some polls with you in a moment to find out um, a little bit more about you as an audience. Um, but for now, do go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, we'll do the same. So just to say hi from us. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'll introduce myself a bit more in a second. Uh, Duncan, do you want to say hi as well? Hello, yes, I'm Duncan. I'm the uh, co-lead of the Scottish uh, chapter. Uh, which has only just started uh, last year. So we're happy to um, welcome you all tonight. Super. Ben, do you want to wave? Hey, guys. I'm Ben. I'm uh, co-lead of NTX London, and uh, you'll be hearing from me a little bit later on in the presentation. Until then, I'll drop off and leave it to Sophie. And Hannah, do you want to Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah, also co-lead of NTX London. Super. Awesome, great. So if you guys want to drop off really quickly, just turn off your camera and mic. Um, I can I can take the lead for for the moment, hopefully. Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we start, do go ahead and, and introduce yourselves in the chat. But as mentioned, we do have some polls to find out a little bit more about you as an audience, kind of what's brought you here. Um, but go ahead and, and let us know your name, let us know where you're dialing in from. Um, and we've got our first poll. Okay, so how are you connected to Neurotech? Let us know, are you academia? Do you work in research? Um, are you from the industry? Are you one of the many startups um, that are doing so many amazing things in the neurotech uh, industry at the moment? Are you a student um, and you're just getting started and you're the next generation of innovators or are you other? I actually come under other because I, I don't work and I don't study and hopefully you can't see my wrinkles on this video, but I haven't been a student for a number of years. Um, so let's see how you guys are doing. It looks as if we've got uh, students and other are tied. Not so many from academia. Uh, got a couple of people from industry. Um, so great to see so many others, so many people who are just really enthusiastic and, and really enjoy neurotech. Um, so that's super. Thanks, everyone, for voting. Um, brilliant. Duncan, if you just want to go ahead and, and close off that poll. Um, so we will be starting in just a few minutes. Uh, so feel free to take this time to grab a quick drink, settle in. We're just going to give a, a, a moment or two for everyone else to join the call. who might be running a tiny bit late. Uh, but we've got a great schedule of events for you tonight. So first, we're going to be hearing from the wonderful leaders, um, who, a few of whom you just met. Um, first of all, of NTX London. Uh, so that's myself, Sophie, Hannah and Ben, um, but also from our newly founded Scotland chapter. So that's Duncan, who you just met, and Yashar should be joining us later. Uh, we're going to be letting you know all about the biggest and best developments in neurotech that happened in 2020. Um, and we're also going to be doing some networking. So I've already taken a look at some of the different names of the people we've got here. We've got some amazing characters um, and we're going to be doing some sort of speed networking later. It's all built into this incredible platform. Um, and so you'll have a chance to meet some like-minded neurotech enthusiasts. Um, then we're also going to be hearing from our amazing speaker. So we've got the incredible Dr. Martin Dinoff um, of Mind, a London-based uh, neurotech startup that's doing amazing stuff in mental health and sort of cognitive well-being um, and we've also got Professor, Professor, Professor. Yes, um, who is going to be telling us a little bit about their work sort of matrix style uh, kind of sci-fi tech. Um, but just before we kick off, I'll just to introduce myself briefly. So my name is Sophie Valentine and I am a co-founder um, I'm one of the leaders of the London chapter of NeurotechX, um, and I've been involved for just over a year now. Uh, in my day job, I also work in product management and health technology, so I'm one of those lucky people um, who gets to do a little bit of neurotech every now and again and, and get paid for it. Um, I'm also involved in a number of different NTX initiatives, working with contacts really from around the world. We're a global community, um, and I'm really looking this year to build up and to continue to build up the London neurotech community. So if you're keen to get involved, find out a bit more about what we do, do a few things with us, then absolutely get involved. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn, Slack, email, wherever. We are always happy to chat. Um, so fantastic. I think what we'll do is go ahead and, and kick off the main part of the presentation. And, and I'm going to start by telling us, uh, sorry, telling you um, just a little bit about um, this sort of event series. So what is it? This is Buzz in Review, and this is NeurotechX's flagship event. Um, it's our biggest of the year, um, and it's a global event, just as NeurotechX is global. So as you can see here, we have events all the way from last week, January 20th through to February 5th, across 19 different chapters throughout the world. Um, each event will have some similarities. Some of the deck that you're about to see will be shared across events, um, but every chapter will have their own surprise and their own speakers and bringing in something a bit different. So it's definitely worth going to more than one um, to find out a little bit more about what's happening in, in different countries and in different areas of the world. Um, plus this Saturday, uh, we've also got 
the Neurobar. So everyone who attended our Neurobar events in sort of summer and towards the end of last year, you'll know how fun the Neurobar is. It's a chance to sit down, have a drink and have a chat with some people doing amazing things in neurotech. Um, so if you're keen to join the Neurobar, please do on Saturday and you can find links to that um, on our website, on our Slack and on our social media as well. So let me tell you a little bit about NeurotechX um, for those who aren't already a member of the community. So we are the largest international community for neurotech enthusiasts, and we pride ourselves on having as few barriers to joining as possible. We want everybody to get involved. The community is free to join, and you don't need to have any prior experience in neurotech at all. Even if you're just a little bit curious, come in, get involved, and we'll have something to offer you. We're simply a platform for helping people who have an interest in neurotech to find out a little bit more, access some great opportunities and make some fantastic connections and really just get involved in, and have a little bit of fun. But saying that, uh, we are also heavily involved in the advancement of neurotech. So we really we get our fingers in lots of pies and, and we roll up our sleeves and we really get involved in the neurotech industry. We work really closely with many startups, VCs, grassroots initiatives, academics, you name it, we work with them. Um, and the aim is really to bring together people with great passion and skills in neurotechnology and, and neuroscience and engineering and all of the different spaces that are relevant to really create something new and exciting and meaningful. So we have a few pillars that really define who NeuroTechX is as a community. Um, and these are community, education and innovation. So via our community, we bring together really diverse people with a passion for and, and some of them also have experience in NeuroTech. Um, and the idea is to help those people really foster connections, build friendships and ultimately to become something greater than the sum of their individual parts. And I can certainly attest to the amazing people who make up this community. Um, through our education initiatives, we also offer resources and learning opportunities to our community. So if you're looking to find out more about neurotech, all the way from learning to code through to understanding the way the human brain works, even through to launching your own startup, we definitely have the resources to help you and we would be absolutely thrilled to do so. And finally, we aim to inspire and to nurture our community to innovate, whether that's creating new neurotech products and, and sort of projects, uh, whether it's asking questions about how neurotech is being developed and who it serves, um, or simply launching new fun initiatives and, and projects to get involved in. Um, you know, we're always there to support people to, to kind of really get involved and ultimately to turn amazing ideas into amazing realities. And finally, just before I pass over to Hannah, I wanted to let you know just a little bit about our community, kind of who we are and what we actually look like. So we have around 16,000 members. Um, that's <clears throat> throughout the world. So as you can see, we're, we're not a small community. Um, and, and those are people who are involved in our sort of Slack community, which is our main communication hub, um, but also who attend a lot of our events worldwide. We have around 13 sort of grassroots initiatives. Um, so that's from our diversity initiative um, to our book. Yes, there is a book. It's on its way. It's coming, I think, this year um, through to our content lab where we're working with writers to create amazing neurotech content. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about these initiatives later, but I think they really attest to the diversity of, of what neurotech experts gets involved in. Um, we've hosted many, many, many events worldwide, um, and those range all the way through from community meetups, so having a, a virtual beer in the virtual pub, through to hackathons, through to educational webinars, looking at areas all the way from plain sort of simple core neuroscience, simple is not the right word to throw in there, <laughs> Um, through to neuroethics, through to kind of how neurotech and design integrate. So there really is something for everyone. Um, and we also have 25 chapters worldwide, and we've seen a huge boom in this across the last year. So we've got now a chapter in India and Australia, which is, is pretty big news for us, um, all the way through to our newly founded Scotland chapter, who, who we'll be hearing from tonight. So if you're looking for a local chapter and you can't find it, then you are more than welcomed to set one up. And we've got some amazing resources to help you do that and to help you build up the community in your local area. NeurotechX is above all a by the people, for the people type community. Um, and so if, if you have enthusiasm for, for doing something, for setting up a chapter, we will always do what we can to help you. So that's enough from me. Uh, we are now ready to kick off the main event. And what I'm going to do is hand over to Hannah Hare, who will be telling us a little bit about the biggest trends of neurotech of the past year. So I will stop sharing my screen. And Hannah, did you want to uh, put your camera mic on? And I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Let's see if I can get my screen up too. Uh, 
that looks like it's working. Wonderful. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so very briefly, uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm Hannah Hare. I'm a physicist by background um, with a PhD in neuroscience. Um, I've got five years experience working in medical device development, um, and I'm currently leading a neurotechnology team at TTP, which is uh, Europe's largest deep tech consultancy, where we help startups get new hardware products out onto the market. Um, and I'm excited to, to share with you today some of the uh, biggest stories, um, biggest trends from neurotechnology within the last year. So to start us off, um, Kernel is a, a very ambitious West Coast startup um, who are developing non-invasive technologies for recording of brain activity. In May last year, they raised $53 million from VCs and private investors, um, bringing the total amount of funding to over $100 million now. And they're using this to develop two different products. Uh, firstly, the Flux device, which works on the principle of MEG sensors, um, which will detect the magnetic fields created by neurons firing in the brain. And secondly, their flow device, which uses optical sensors to measure changes in blood flow within the brain um, via near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, both of these approaches have been used before in research, uh, but Kernel plan to make them much more widely available through their neuroscience as a service offering. In October, they went on to reveal much more detail around their flow device, um, which includes some of the pictures that you can see here. In November, they demonstrated the simultaneous use of their kernel flow device and a Neo VR headset. Um, and then in December, they announced that the first 50 flow systems will be available early in 2021. And almost half of these are going to be offered to elite academic and industry groups in order to perform novel research into a really wide range of topics, um, everything from neuro rehabilitation, uh, concussion, aging, stroke, um, Alzheimer's and lots of other other applications. Um, another company that's um, released a lot of information over the last year is called Synchron. Um, they're an Australian company who have developed uh, an entirely new type of neuromodulation device. Um, so the Stentrode, which you can see on the images here, um, it's a tiny device that consists of 16 individual electrodes, um, which are incorporated into a tiny wire mesh. Um, this mesh is inserted into the brain through a vein in the neck and is then positioned in the blood vessels just outside the motor cortex in the brain. So similar to how a heart stent might be inserted through the vein in a leg um, in order to avoid open heart surgery, this stentrode uh, enables minimally invasive insertion of, uh, of a device into the brain um, without having to get into the brain through the skull like you normally would. So Synchron's first application is to help people with um, paralysis, such as suffering from things like ALS, and to help them communicate again. Um, so the first clinical implantation of the Stentrode device actually happened at the very end of 2019. Um, and then in mid-2020, they secured uh, an additional million Australian dollar funding round from the Australian government, um, bringing their total amount of funding up to about two and a half million Australian dollars. Um, also in August, they presented the findings of their first um, in-human examination of, of the Stentrode at uh, the SNIS meeting. And they received um, the breakthrough device designation from the FDA, um, which should hopefully accelerate the, its path to medical approvals in the US. Um, later on in the year, in October, they published a paper describing how the Stentrode has been used to help two ALS patients. Um, they both had these devices implanted and after a period of training have been able to use them to perform day to day activities in their own home, um, including things like sending text messages, writing emails, browsing the Internet, um, doing online shopping and, and online banking, um, which were all things that they had not been able to do beforehand um, and that they were now able to do very independently by using this device. Um, so this is a really cool kind of minimally invasive device um, with many more potential applications, both for neurosensing and also neurostimulation. 
Um, and on to prostheses. So prostheses are perhaps one of the more obvious, more common applications of, of BCIs. Um, losing a limb is obviously devastating and, and kind of limits what you can achieve independently in, in daily life. Um, and there have been quite a lot of stories in 2020 about advances in prostheses and particularly in prosthetic hands. Um, so making a prosthetic hand and attaching that to the body can already be done. Um, the real difficulty is in how to control that uh, in an intuitive and helpful way. So in the last year, the University of Michigan um, surgically attached a small graft of healthy muscle tissue to the end of uh, the nerve in an amputee's arm. Um, and this promotes healthy nerve growth and really amplifies what are very small biological signals um, in, in those nerves. Uh, they then use sensors to detect EMG signals from the nerves um, in order to very intuitively control different um, gestures, different finger movements. Um, so by way of example, the image on the top left here, you can see somebody very gently stacking blocks using a prosthetic arm using this device. Um, in July this year, there was a story published, a really interesting story. Um, a man called Ian Davis um, unfortunately lost all four of the fingers on his left hand in a work accident um, and then discovered that insurance wouldn't cover the cost of, of getting a prosthetic um, because his palm was still intact. And in order to qualify, he would have had to have lost his entire hand and not just his fingers. Um, but this was obviously really impacting um, his life. And being a bit of a tinkerer, he decided to build himself a prosthetic hand. Um, so this is, you can see this on the image on the bottom right. Um, it's a fully mechanical device. Um, so there's no worries about batteries running out of power. It's fully waterproof. Um, but also the response time is incredibly fast. It's only fractions of a second, um, much faster than some electronics um, prostheses might be. And he's continued to add more functionality to, the, to this hand, such as a kind of splay function as well as a, a grip function. A um, couple of other stories from last year. Um, Atom Touch have, an, have announced um, a kind of, sorry, Atom Limbs have announced their Atom Touch device, um, which is a prosthetic hand controlled by external EMG sensors, which are placed in a cuff around um, the kind of the, the residual limb which you might just be able to make out on the, the top right image there. Um, and this, with this uh, device, they've been able to move individual fingers, which is pretty cool. Um, and then also the Tesla suit glove uh, is a pretty cool device that's recently been announced. Um, so this can detect the movements of the wearer's hands um, and can also then give live feedback in order to control the accuracy of those movements. Um, so it includes uh, sensors such as impedance measurements, it includes a pulse oximeter, um, it can very accurately detect the positioning of the fingers and the wrist, uh, and it can then also give feedback via haptics, via vibrations or increased resistance to movement. Um, and there are a lot of potential applications for this, including medical rehabilitation, um, but also uh, as a kind of an interface for, for gaming, for example. Um, so a few examples of some of the cool stuff that's happened in academia over the last year as well that's come out of research. Um, so researchers at the uh, University of Pittsburgh have repurposed existing spinal cord stimulation devices in order to restore the sense of touch in lost limbs. Um, so this is particularly cool because it's, it's kind of reusing an existing technology for a new application. Um, spinal cord stimulators are already being implanted in about 50,000 people a year um, for chronic pain relief. Um, and you can imagine these as very kind of long, thin devices, um, a bit like a, a spaghetti noodle, um, which contain a string of electrodes. And these sit all along the, the spinal cord. And what the researchers did was they kind of stimulated the individual electrodes, um, asked people to report what they were feeling and, and where, which part of the limb which they've lost. Um, and were then able to use the same electrodes to generate a sense of touch when the prosthesis was being used. Um, so, yeah, they, they were really were able to um, kind of restore that lost sense of touch. 
And in a separate study, researchers in Switzerland were able to make paralyzed rodents walk again by stimulating damaged spinal cords. Um, and they used AI to pinpoint exactly which neurons were involved in that gait reacquisition. Um, and they're already applying this technique in humans as well to help uh, paraplegics regain some of their mobility during a, a clinical trial in, in Lausanne. So in neurotechnology, we regularly use sensors to measure both electrical and magnetic activity of the nerves. Um, often these sensors can be quite bulky um, or even if they're relatively small, they often require kind of conductive gels in order to get good contact between the sensor and the skin. Um, but temporary tattoo electrodes are a really interesting new way of measuring electrical signals. They sit directly on top of the skin, um, which means that they they can have really quite a good quality of recordings while still being almost imperceptible to the wearer. And an Italian team of researchers um, have developed a new method to inkjet print these tattoo electrodes. Um, and they've demonstrated that these these tattoos, these kind of temporary tattoos can detect EEG signals um, and that they're also compatible with MEG scans, um, which is really useful for, for research applications. Um, so it's really quite a, quite a neat solution. Um, I guess you probably have to be willing to shave your head, as, as you can see, for this participant here. Um, there's another group at the University of Houston which has taken a similar approach in terms of uh, on-skin sensing. Uh, in this case, instead of printing a sensor and then attaching it to the skin, um, they've taken a slightly different approach whereby they're drawing the electronics directly onto the skin um, using various forms of electronics inks, um, including conductors, semiconductors and dielectrics. And they've worked hard to make these materials extremely conformable so that they stick on well, but also minimize any motion artifacts. Um, and these skin circuits can be used for various different forms of biosensing. Um, and there's also some indication that by stimulating these, um, these kind of circuits on the skin, that this might accelerate um, the healing of, of skin wounds, which is another really cool potential application. So we've talked a bit already about prostheses for hands or for limbs, um, but there's also been some really impressive work done um, to help restore people's vision as a kind of visual prosthetic. So usually when people go blind, it's due to damage either to the eye itself or to the optic nerve connecting the eye to the brain. Um, but in most cases, the, the visual part of the brain itself actually remains intact. So the challenge here is how to bypass the eyes and reach the visual cortex directly. And this team in Houston has developed a new system um, which consists of a video camera, a processing unit, a transmitter, and then a small implant inside the brain um, where that implant consists of a sheet of 60 tiny electrodes um, which sit on the surface of the, the brain itself, the surface of the visual cortex. And to see a picture similar to how you might draw out a shape on some palm of somebody's hand, um, this device draws out a simple shape into the visual cortex. Um, which has allowed patients to visualize letters. They've described it as being like, like seeing skywriting. Um, so far, the details are a little bit limited um, because there's only 60 electrodes to draw these shapes with, but it's already proved really useful for, for seeing basic shapes and is a very promising proof of concept study. And there's another group at, at Monash University in, in Melbourne, Australia, um, who have used a, a slightly similar approach in that it also, again, for visual prosthesis, um, it also has a, a camera, uh, kind of smartphone style electronics, and then a, a brain implant. Um, in this case, the implant consists of um, over 170 microelectrodes, which actually sit inside the visual cortex. Uh, each one of which is thinner than a human hair. So it might look a bit vicious on this image, but these are absolutely tiny sensors. Um, they have completed their preclinical studies in sheep um, with no kind of adverse effects found over, over nine months. And they're just now gearing up for their first in human trials. Um, and the team here think that the, the application of this technology um, could go far beyond restoring vision. So their first studies are, are um, kind of proof of concept studies uh, for the visual cortex. Um, but they also think they might be able to treat other neurological conditions 
um, such as paralysis, for example. Uh, and that rounds off um, that rounds off my part of the presentation. So I will hand over to Ben Woodington for the next section. Hello, guys. Let me just see if I can share my screen as well. Uh, I think that's sharing. Hannah, can you confirm? Yes, that's sharing great. Before that, I was a medical device development engineer, so perhaps I've done my career in reverse um, when compared to Hannah. Uh, it was very, very cold here in Cambridge today. I think we've got some of our Canadian friends on the phone, and I think we may have been competing with you this morning for once in our lives. Um, so we just wanted to run quickly through some of the tech innovations of this year, slight overlap with the previous section. Um, but really exciting year last year. We wanted to show you some of the consumer-grade imaging and simulation platforms that were launched. Possibly last year we saw, this is unverified, but possibly last year we saw more of these systems than we have seen ever before. Um, to run through them very quickly, we saw uh, Zito's uh, ZEEG system. Um, they provide, they're providing the first FDA-cleared zero prep, completely wireless and dry electrode headset. Um, so this means that this can be used out of the box um, without an expert on board for urgent EEG, wherever it's needed. We saw the Neurosity Notion uh, version 2 launched. Um, very, very powerful device uh, with onboard internet con con connectivity and onboard machine learning, meaning that you no longer need your, your bulky laptop attached to the system. Um, we saw this GTEC pangolin system, um, a very, very beautiful system, um, looking like the scales of a pangolin on that person's head there. Um, the world's first ultra-high density electrode grid with biopotential amplifier system, works with wet electrodes and can measure EEG, EMG, and other bio signals as well. Um, they, they did a very cool um, artist collaboration on this device. I would highly recommend you, you look it up on YouTube, um, where they had this, this dress that was reacting and moving to the, uh, to the model's thoughts as well. And we saw the um, Galea system from uh, OpenBCI, another very cool system um, offering biometrics with mixed reality as well, integrating EEG, EMG, EDA, PPG, and eye tracking signals into one single headset. So very excited um, to see that soon, um, which is going to be integrated into AR and VR mounted displays. Um, I guess you guys have heard a lot about the integration of these newer technologies in gaming. Um, it's going to be very exciting to see where that headset leads uh, in the gaming space. And then on stimulation, we saw the NeuroRhythm device, uh, the first gesture-controlled headband um, to help improve sleep, increase relaxation, sharper, sharpen focus. The Cove system, uh, a wearable device that applies vibrations actually behind the ears um, on the mastoid and the temporal bones. Um, Again, this is designed to activate the deeper parts of your brain um, that are involved in stress. We also saw the NeuroBus or FUS Pro transcranial focus ultrasound device, um, which we haven't seen much of recently. Uh, this system can be used to administer low intensity pulse transcranial ultrasound to the human brain, enabling high spatial resolution neuromodulation um, just beneath the cortical surface. So really quite a lot out last year. We saw Paradromics unveil their uh, Argo system. Um, very cool system. There's a, a paper which I think is in an archive, which again, would definitely recommend uh, checking it out. Um, maybe if Sophie's there, she can post a link in the chat later. Um, but they have a system that is capable of recording up to over 65,000 channels. And in the paper, they demonstrated recording from 30,000 electro channels on the sheep cortex. Very exciting startup. They've got funding from DARPA in the US and venture capital as well. They're going to be using their first device to treat um, severe paralysis, I believe. And they're expecting to um, get that into the clinic in 2023, which is, which is really quite soon. 
obviously, what more can we say about Neuralink? I'm sure so many people on this call are familiar with the news. Um, it was possibly last year's most hotly anticipated piece of news and announcement, and then also possibly the most debated announcement uh, after, after we saw it. We saw the story of the three little piggies, um, one of which had never had a neural implant, uh, one of which had the implant actually installed and then removed to show that the, the pig was actually fine, survived the procedure quite well. And then we saw the final pig, the one that was quite reluctant to remove, to leave the cage, if I remember correctly, that actually had the implant still in. And we saw um, the the link picking up uh, the neurons firing as this as the as the pig sort of sniffed around the pen. Um, very exciting to see that. But also, um, I think above all else, we saw that Musk and Neuralink are really committed to the neurotech space. Um, since then, there, there are tons of jobs um, that have been announced from Neuralink, and also they're opening up several new sites. So really excited to see where that goes as well. I think lots of people in the space are. Uh, and finally, on this section, before we dive into a break, um, there was a, a very cool collaboration between UCL, Cambridge University, Rosie Hospital, and a new startup, um, Gower Labs. Gower Labs, um, this high high density diffuse optical tomography system. Um, so this uses completely harmless levels of red and infrared, near infrared light delivered via this wearable cap, which means we can actually image, generate three D images of the baby's brain activity. In, look at brain activity in uh, child development. And this means that we can start imaging babies' brains without needing MRI. Um, MRI machines are incredibly expensive. I have learned recently that there are really very few of them around, um, very few of them in hospitals. But the other problem with MRI is the, uh, the, the, the subject needs to stay still. And if anyone on my call has young children or babies, uh, it's probably quite difficult to keep them still for half an hour inside an MRI machine. The other exciting um, part of this work, this study, this device also, is it means that researchers can now study the developments of the infant brain uh, in, in any environment, not inside a probably quite scary MRI machine to the child, but for these children at home where babies and their parents can naturally interact and the babies can, can interact with their, with their natural environment. So again, very cool collaboration and uh, definitely worth checking out. So that's a quick whiz through um, our tech innovation side. Um, we're going to take a quick break, just about on time, two minutes past the hour. Um, so I, I, I don't know if you'd seen in the in the um, in the invitation, but we're we're running a cocktail party. So we're going to take fifteen minute breaks. Um, you'll get the chance to network one on one with whoever the algorithm of this software decides to pair you up with. I think we're taking about 15 minutes. Um, so if you can correct me if that's wrong. So you'll get the chance to pair with up to three people um, for four minutes. Don't worry if you don't want to join in. Feel free to go get a coffee, a, a tea, whatever else you'd like. Um, and you can, you can join back in 15 minutes later. If you join the networking and you want to drop off after the first person that you meet, by all means, uh, drop off. Um, and that's fine. And um, you'll be dropped back into the to the main call once the cocktail party ends in 15 minutes. Hi, Sophie. Can you start Hi. it? I, or yeah, I, I think Hannah's it. just going to start the cocktail bar. I am. I am just trying to start the cocktail bar. Amazing. Looking forward to it. And, and as Ben mentioned, if you want to grab a drink instead um, and, and sort of top up your wine glass, then just hold tight on the call. We're going to be back in a few minutes um, and we'll be telling you a little bit more about what's been happening in the neurotech world in 2020, as well as our amazing guest speakers, Dr. Martin Dinov um, and Professor George Malia. Hello, I think we've just been told we're back live. Um, so unless anyone stops me. Oh. <laughs> Hi there. Yeah. Okay. So we'll continue going then. Excellent. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of a uh, little bit of networking. Um, we might have another session uh, later, actually, if we uh, have time for it. So you can hear from me again. I'm afraid um, we're going to run through some regulatory um, approvals and then some tech funding stuff, and then we're going to go down to the um, NTX thing competitions that have gone on before we move on to um, our two excellent speakers that we've got lined up. So let me just share my screen again.
Awesome. So we just want to run through some of the regulatory approvals. Obviously, we talk about some of this amazing uh, science, some of the amazing innovations that happen in academia and in startups. But um, unless these things get approved for use, they stay in the lab. And this is this is no good. Many of us are interested in uh, the medical application of these technologies. Um, so we just want to run through a kind of brief timeline of some of the things that happen um, in May. A company called Neuroelectrics, who many of you may know, um, received the FDA um, approval to conduct their clinical trial. Um, they've developed a novel platform to provide personalized therapies for brain disorders using non-invasive brain stimulation. So approval from the FDA means they can conduct a clinical trial um, in brain stimulation at home through telemedicine for patients with major depressive uh, major depressive syndrome. The investigational device exemption that they that they received um, ha has possibly been received through um, COVID, the COVID restrictions, meaning that this has been accelerated. Um, this is pretty, I don't know, we can look at this as a silver lining to, to COVID, right? Um, I think many people think that there should be and will be more of a move to telemedicine and the coronavirus pandemic may accelerate this. Um, Cool. Another interesting announcement, maybe something that you don't hear from us very often, usually hear from about us from uh, medical devices and, and machine learning approaches and all kinds of things like this. But this is a, a gaming approach, actually. Um, Achilles has announced the FDA clearance of Endeavor RX. Um, this is for children with ADHD. And it's actually the first prescription treatment which is delivered through a video game. So the FDA has granted clearance for them um, to provide uh, this is a treatment for ADHD delivered through a captivating video game experience. Um, it's shown to improve attention function. And it's backed by data from five clinical studies, um, randomized clinical studies. So this would be really interesting. Um, again, it may move it may move the world forward to a, to a place where uh, FDA clearance of gaming and the prescription of gaming like and gamification of medicine might become more commonplace. So this is about the FDA approval of a new uh, deep brain stimulator. Um, so the larger players in, in the medical device space, Medtronic, Abbott and Boston, I guess they're sometimes seen as being a little bit slow off the market, slow to adopt. But, but this is really cool news. Um, they received the FDA approval for their Percept PC deep brain stimulation platform. Um, so this is going to be the first and only DBS system that's available clinically. Um, which can actually chronically capture and record brain signals while also delivering therapy to patients with neurological disorders. Um, so that's those associated with Parkinson's disease, central tremor, dystonia, epilepsy, and also OCD. Um, this is really cool because it means that physicians are now going to be able to track the brain signals as these patients are being treatment treated. And it also leads us down the road of closed loop stimulation. Um, that is not what this device is for, there is still a doctor, a, clin a clinician on the end um, looking at these signals. But I think many people in the space would agree that and argue for the fact that closed loop stimulation is, is coming and should be accelerated. And uh, this is a step towards that, definitely. So we saw the approval of Abbott's iOS compatible app for the management of chronic pain and movement disorders. Again, um, another cool announcement and sort of moving towards the direction of the of personalized medicine and also the patient owning their own um, treatment rather than being prescribed blindly a treatment paradigm. Um, so this allows patients with neurological conditions, including chronic pain uh, or movement disorders, to actually manage their therapy directly from their own smartphones. Um, the approval eliminates the need to carry a completely separate patient programmer device, but also like relying on a clinical programmer. Um, a GP or a nurse that will actually have to program each time. So it streamlines the patient's experience, integrates therapy management into their life. For physicians who are prescribing and implementing neuromodulation technologies, the ability to integrate therapies into one's everyday life is absolutely is absolutely key. Again, I think um, this ties in with the COVID global health crisis is obviously this has been in development by Abbott for a number of years, but perhaps COVID has accelerated some of these technologies and trying to move the patient from having to go to a doctor's surgery each time they need to possibly tune one of their neuromodulation um, parameters. Instead, 
being at home, enabling telehealth and just being on the phone to the doctor. Another cool FDA clearance, uh, this is Brainwave's uh, DTMS system. Um, this company intends to execute uh, a controlled US market release in 2021. Again, very, very early, um, but very exciting. This is the company's third, third FDA cleared indication for deep TMS. Um, it's the first FDA clearance in the addiction space for any TMS device. Um, it's actually a space that's, that's a little bit more alien to me, but um, it's exciting to see neuromodulation actually being, being put out onto the market for addiction rather than, again, just um, in the research space. Um, it's the third approval. It was going to lead to a solution which uh, would may lead to widespread acceptance and increased number of successful quitters. At the moment, I think if you spoke to someone with uh, tobacco, alcohol addiction or opioid addiction and you pitched them um, neuromodulation, it's probably still seen as quite um, alien a concept and not necessarily something that a doctor would jump to first, but hopefully this will put it further in people's minds. Um, this is more in my area of research. We'll know much more about this. Uh, we saw the award of a CE mark for the world's first closed loop spinal cord stimulator, stimulator platform. Again, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think we are going down this road of closed loop stimulation rather than um, recording, having a doctor or an engineer analyze those, those, uh, that information and then tuning each time it needs to be tuned. Um, this is gained lots and lots of traction uh, from Medtronic and Boston, and they received funding from um, GlaxoSmithKline as well. So I think a lot of people are going to be jumping on this, and um, we'll be seeing probably some of the big players following following in their footsteps. Um, these systems work by um, stimulating on the spinal cord. These are for, for pain management primarily, and that evoked potential is, is measured somewhere else. And the system can then... Um, optimize itself to deliver the best form of neuromodulation for, for pain. Um, something that Hannah touched on uh, earlier, we saw the FDA approving uh, as an investigational device for take home use, um, this DECA Luke prosthetic arm um, using the Utah array. Again, very exciting um, to see this investigational device used. It's gonna be their next evolution of peripheral nerve uh, interfaces. And this is interfaces that uh, interface directly with the nerves rather than um, looking at residual muscle. It means that someone that's had a full uh, upper arm amputation can actually use this device. Um, with the FDA approval, further nerve research is gonna be definitely taken forward with this slant array. Um, and the take, take home trial is gonna start uh, relatively soon actually. Uh, the haptics regulatory approval may facilitate progress and approval of Santa rays for other peripheral nerve systems. Um, again, very exciting, such as order, auditory nerve implants, um, spinal cord injuries for the treatment of um, bladder control or sexual function, also pain mitigation, of course. And um, the final note, we've got two more left, two more slides left. Um, first ever treatment shown to reverse uh, Alzheimer's, first neuromodulation treatment shown al Alzheimer's anyway. Again, um, they've received FDA breakthrough device status, which means they can actually accelerate their trials. Um, so the FDA is exp expediting uh, the revolutionary clinical stage device to beat back Alzheimer's disease, and it's an at-home treatment. Um, this device has previously shown to reverse, to some degree, Alzheimer's memory loss in its pilot study, um, which was published uh, last year in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. No other drug or device has received breakthrough designation um, as of yet. So this, is, this is very exciting. Again, it shows that there is... Um, a lot of pressure on this field, I guess, to perform and live up to the FDA's expectations. Um, the FDA has given this breakthrough status to 300 devices, over 10, 100 drugs, um, but none of them have been for Alzheimer's disease. Many of them actually have been, in the last year in a way, have been through neuromodulation, um, neuromodulation devices, which is, which is very interesting. Great, and finally, um, this isn't a regulatory approval, um, but exciting nonetheless. Um, this is Onward, um, formerly known as GTX Medical, which was the spin out out of um, the core team group in EPFL. 
Um, they have started recruiting for their arc therapy platform. So this is using targeted but external spinal cord stimulation in order to enable the movement of people with spinal cord injury related paralysis. Um, so within the next two years, we're going to start seeing results out of that study, which will be very exciting. Um, possibly the only company at the moment working on spinal cord stimulation for injury related paralysis. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the external platform, but they are also developing an implantable platform, which, which much of their work and research looked into. So it's going to be very exciting to see when they start uh, recruiting for that, which I imagine will be much more difficult to recruit for. Um, but exciting to see we'll have uh, numbers in the hundreds, whether these technologies do indeed work for restoring function to people with full, full uh, spinal cord injury related paralysis. Uh, that is everything from me. I think we're moving on to uh, Duncan now. Thanks, Stop Ben. Very much. Um, Perfect. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Duncan Lowe. I'm a, um, my background is, is medical. I'm a research re registrar at the Canisburn Plastic Surgery Unit in Glasgow. Um, I've got a... Uh, a MSc in biomedical engineering from Imperial College, and I'm currently studying uh, for a PhD in deep learning applications uh, for hand surgery at the University of Strathclyde. Um, I'm going to uh, announce some of the latest investment and business news in uh, neurotechnology over the past year. There have been um, a number of successful Kickstarter campaigns. Uh, the Dutch company MindAffect raised over 15,000 euros for their Build Your Own BCI project. Uh, harnessing their experience of helping locked-in patients, their aim is to supply Raspberry Pi with their own EEG decoding algorithms pre-programmed onto it uh, to developers who are seeking to build their own brain-controlled apps. Canadian company Brink Bionics Impulse is a gaming peripheral uh, which I noticed some people were discussing in the chat earlier, uh, that enables you to react at the speed of thought. Um, through EMG, it recognizes your intention to click your mouse and cuts out the lag time between muscle activation and the actual execution of movement, which uh, shaves off about 80 milliseconds from your reaction time, uh, which can be life and death in a first-person shooter game. Uh, they achieved their Kickstarter pledge uh, a goal of 15,000 Canadian dollars in less than 12 hours following the launch uh, and have raised over $55,000 um, before the end of their pledge window. And um, Happy is the first wearable technology that alters your mood on command. It uses unique magnetic fields that target specific responses in the brain and body to guide the wearer to their desired state of arousal, be it calm, sleepy, happy, relaxed, alert, or focused. They raised over half a million US dollars. Rune Labs Incorporated announced in October that it had secured a $5 million seed round investment. Rune Labs uh, partners with leading medtech and pharma companies to label, organize, and analyze brain data. Uh, and it's particularly focused on neuromodulation therapies such as deep brain stimulation and trans uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. These device-based therapies generate a lot of data, uh, including directly sensed uh, brain signals. But usually this data is uh, underutilized uh, in clinical trials and patient care as um, DBS and TMS manufacturers don't have a way to manage brain data at a large scale. With Rune Labs platform, however, uh, brain data can be sequenced both longitudinally for a single patient, uh, but also across multiple patients, multiple studies, and even multiple centers. Compatible with industry leading systems, as well as mobile health apps and devices like Apple Watch, uh, Rune Labs aims to, de uh, to enhance delivery of precision therapy to patients by personalizing neuromodulation, resulting in better control of their symptoms. In July, MagStim, the global leader in transcranial magnetic stimulation, announced an agreement to acquire the product portfolio of Electrical Geodesics Incorporated. 
EGI designed non-invasive multimodal technologies to monitor brain activity and to deliver transcranial electrical stimulation in brain research, in particular, the high-density EEG. This will, in essence, close the loop for development of a comprehensive system for non-invasive neuromodulation, as the merging of TMS and high-density EEG will facilitate future innovations, potentially leading to personalised treatments based on biological markers. In July, Belfast-based tech firm Neurovalens raised £5 million to expand trials for its headsets, which have been developed to stimulate parts of the brain to treat conditions such as diabetes, insomnia, anxiety and obesity. The latest funding is expected to increase the number of trials and create around 10 to 15 jobs over the next two years. Neurovalence is already in its final phase of trials for obesity and aims to have approval for insomnia and anxiety devices in the next 12 months, with diabetes trials slated for this year. Nia Therapeutics Incorporated, developer of an implantable brain stimulation technology designed to restore memory function to patients with memory impairment, uh, announced um, in August that it had closed a $1.5 million uh, in new financing to expand its uh, engineering team and finalize the design of its implantable neuromodulation platform. The smart neurostimulation system senses brain activity related to memory and stimulates the brain with gentle pulses of electricity to restore good memory function. Uh, NIA's focus is on treating patients with memory impairment due to traumatic brain injury as well as neurodegenerative diseases. In August, US companies Estellas Pharma and IOTA Biosciences announced a merger agreement in which Estellas will uh, acquire IOTA. IOTA was established in 2017 and holds exclusive licenses to an innovative technology known as Neural Dust that uses ultrasound to both power implantable devices and to enable wireless communication. This has resulted in the ability to develop uh, ultra small and battery free wireless implantable medical devices. Both companies had previously entered an R&D agreement um, to jointly conduct research associated with Neurodust in a number of indications. Uh, the utilization of IOTA's unique technology as a platform to advance, uh, advance innovation in the bioelectrics field is expected to accelerate Estellas's RX Plus business, not only by expediting the RX Plus projects previously covered uh, in the R&D agreement, but also by allowing exploration of other applications of neural dust for new target diseases and development of new technologies. I'll now bring you some uh, news about a few open competitions that uh, concluded last year. Novella Neurotech, in collaboration with Neurotech X, uh, proposed a Neureka, um, a challenge on seizure prediction using the TUH EEG seizure dataset. The data set comprises over a thousand hours of EEG recordings across almost 700 patients uh, and includes recordings of more than three and a half thousand seizure events. The goal was to uh, have the best performance at picking up seizure events uh, across the subjects uh, while, having, while using as few EEG channels as possible. And the winners of this competition were the Belgian group Biomeda Regulars, who achieved a sensitivity of 12.37% and a false alert rate of just 1.4 in 24 hours. Neosensory, the developers of the Neosensory Buzz wristband, uh, in July launched their first developer contest for innovative uses of their product. Uh, originally designed to alert hearing impaired patients to certain sounds via vibration at the wrist, the aim of the competition was to develop a new app to interface with the Buzz wristband. The winner of this competition was Chris Bartley with his air quality sensor. He leveraged volatile organic compound sensors to increase vibration intensity as air quality deteriorates. Uh, runners up included Sam Chin's submission for sensing CO2 as a measure of room ventilation quality and COVID-19 risk. 
and Ian Pengra's obstacle detector, which uses ultrasound as a blind navigation aid. Uh, a second competition has recently closed to submissions now, uh, and we're all very excited to hear what other innovations come out of this one. The winners of this year's Neurotech X Student Clubs Competition Open Challenge uh, were McGill Neurotech uh, with their EMG board. The EMG board uses surface EMG electrodes placed over the forearm muscles and interprets the signals in order to classify the finger movements. The predicted movements are then rendered into their Unity application as either input controls or text, uh, thus offering a novel, a novel way for um, consumers to interact with AR and VR systems. The runners-up of the Open Challenge was Polycortex with their Polydodo, uh, an EEG-based system that offers a cheaper and more accessible way to perform sleep studies at home. And the winners of the Fix Challenge were Mint, with their product Jellyfish, which is an adjustable EEG headset that is suitable for different head sizes and comfortable to wear for a long time, and also has a tubing system for distributing saline to their 3D printed electrodes. Bitbrain's calls for project aim to support outstanding research projects in the field of human behavior research and brain computer interfaces, with a sponsorship fund of 150,000 euros. They received a total of 236 proposals by the closure of their submission window in September, and the quality of proposals was so high that they expanded their sponsorship fund by a further €20,000 in order to support six projects, three from each uh, topic, and those projects will start this year. The details of the six projects can be found on the Bitbrain website. And uh, build as the Bionic Olympics Cybathlon held its second incarnation in 2020 after a very successful launch in 2016. 51 teams from 20 countries competed against each other, completing everyday tasks with the help of state-of-the-art assistance systems from across six disciplines. The uh, powered arm prosthesis race, the powered leg prosthesis race, the powered exoskeleton race, the brain-computer interface race, the powered wheelchair race, and the Functional Electrical Stimulation Bicycle Race. And I actually had the pleasure of attending the inaugural Cybathlon in 2016 and would highly recommend to anyone interested in bionic reconstruction or rehabilitation uh, to try and attend uh, the next uh, planned incarnation in Zurich in 2024. It really is a very cool day. And I'll now hand back to Sophie, who I think has some community news. I absolutely do. That's great. OK, fingers crossed we'll be able to leave our houses in 2024. Um, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Duncan and, and Hannah and Ben um, for that roundup. We're nearly done with our Neurotech X deck um, and I will be quick because I know you guys are really excited to hear um, from uh, from Martin and from uh, George. So let me just very quickly share my screen and I want to let you guys know a little bit. Um, about some community efforts um, that we've been involved in in Neurotech X because we are we're a community and we do lots of things and as you have seen from the information about competitions we have so many opportunities um, and I just want to show you a, a roundup of three of the initiatives we've got we have absolutely loads of them um, and these are all initiatives that we're always looking for people to get involved in um, so first of all let me tell you a little bit about um, our diversity initiative so diversity and inclusion are they're fundamental to the social justice of any organization uh, but we also know that as a community and as a neurotech industry what we're able to do and, and what we can achieve is actually limited where we have a lack of diversity um, and so what we want to do as we build and grow our community is to reduce as far as possible any barriers a person may experience to getting involved in ntx and the neurotech space in general um, and we really want our diversity initiatives to be steered by diverse voices that come from different backgrounds um, and, and have different experiences. Uh, but we recognize, of course, that the responsibility to address diversity issues shouldn't be placed solely on the shoulders of those people who are traditionally underserved. 
Um, so what we've got, we've, we've built this sort of diversity initiative and we've got a two tier system um, and it consists of a sort of a committee and a consortium. So the smaller committee allows people with time and energy to drive our diversity initiatives forward. And, and I'm really proud to be one of those people, um, you know, kind of putting in the time to make sure we can get these things over the line. Um, but we also have a larger consortium, which will allow a wider group of people to just help us know that what we're doing is going in the right direction and we're making the right choices um, and we're, we're sort of serving the right people. Um, and our diversity initiatives are always looking to expand. So if you would like to be involved um, either in the committee or in the consortium, so either doing lots of things or just kind of raising your voice every now and again, um, then hop on over to the diversity channel in our um, NTX Slack and we'll share a link um, to join the Slack if you're not already in there um, and introduce yourself and, and really just get involved because there's, there's loads of fun things to do. Um, great, so now let me tell you, this is a really fun one, EEG Notebooks. This is really one for the neurohackers. Um, so our EEG Notebooks initiatives ultimately is a way for you to run your own cognitive neuroscience experiments via your own computer um, using one of several supported mobile EEG systems. So this is fantastic. If you have something like a Muse or like an emotive epoch and you want to do some cool experiments with it, this is the way you can do it. You don't need to have degrees in cognitive neuroscience. You can tap into EEG uh, notebooks. Um, so the library comes with a set of standard experiments you can run. Um, and the leaders of this initiative are always looking to add new experimental paradigms um, and new ways of analyzing brainwave data and, and you know, kind of really expanding what, what you can do with this notebook. Um, so there's a link uh, up on your screen um, to the GitHub repository. Um, and so if you'd like to get involved in developing this initiative further, if you are one of those cool people who knows all of the science bit and, and how to write code to analyze brainwaves, and you know what these paradigms are like, then do get in touch. Um, you can get in touch on Slack, LinkedIn, wherever suits you. Um, and let us know what you'd like to contribute. And, and the team is currently actively looking for contributors. So now is it's a really good time. Um, and just one final initiative to let you know a little bit about, um, and this is uh, a little bit indulgent because I'm actually quite heavily involved in this one as well. That's me on the right. Um, so the NTX Content Laboratory, it's an initiative to create content by our community for our community and with our community in mind. So what we are, we're a team of writers, editors and designers across NeurotechX and across the Neurotech community um, that have come together to create original content um, that sort of shares new information about neurotechnology, um, whether that's uh, a new FDA approval has come out and we want to break down the way the science works, um, or whether it's one of the examples you can see here, talking about how neurotechnology and architecture intersect. Um, we even have some fiction pieces. Um, so there's a really broad scope that we're creating, um, and do keep your eyes peeled as we will be releasing the first wave of pieces in coming weeks. Um, and you can check out the titles here on this slide. Um, we'll also be looking to expand the various teams in future. So keep your eyes peeled for calls for contributors coming soon. Um, so as we have mentioned throughout this talk, we would love for you to stay in touch with us. And you can see how to do that. Um, so you've got our website, neurotechx.com, info at neurotechx.com as well. That's our email address if you want to get in touch, have a chat. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Slack. Slack is where most of uh, most of our fun things happen. Um, but also this event tonight has been brought to you by the London and Scotland chapters. And, and really quickly, I just want to let you know how you can stay in touch with the London chapter. Um, so first of all, our Twitter, I spend definitely way too much time pulling together content for our Twitter, but I'm keen that I can serve the London community with all of the best news um, and the best events and the best opportunities. So please do follow us at Neurotech LDN. Um, there's some amazing content. We put out a lot of stuff um, and we would love to share that with you. Um, if you want to drop us an email, you can also email ldn at neurotechx.com. And you can also find us on Slack. Our channel is underscore London. Um, and what I will do is very quickly let Duncan pop up as I think he had a message about our Scotland chapter and how to get in touch there. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to echo what Sophie's just said and uh, also like to say to any of our Scottish guests who have missed out on their Burns Night Supper today to they can attend uh, this webinar or to anyone who's watching on the recording online that we have recently started up uh, Neurotech X Scotland. Um, we're just uh, starting out and uh, we're looking for new re new members to, to join the community. Uh, so the link is here. Uh, I'll share it in the chat as well. Please do come and join. And of course, you can also follow us on Twitter at Neurotech X underscore SCT. Thanks very much. Super. Thanks, Duncan. Um, yeah, as he mentioned, follow us, get in touch. Both of the communities are looking to be um, to be built out. And so we um, we would love to get you involved as much as you want to be. And you can reach out to any of the speakers you've, you've heard from tonight on LinkedIn. 
Um, so I think we've got we've got our amazing speakers coming on, and I'm really excited um, in about 10 minutes. Um, so for the moment, I think what we'll do, Hannah, if you'd be happy to put us on for a little bit more networking, um, maybe if we do two rounds of four minutes um, so we can give people a little bit of time to either have a chat or, as Ben mentioned before, if you're not keen to have a chat with someone um, or you just need to refill your glass, then feel free to hop off um, and uh, grab a drink really quickly. Um, so what we'll do, we'll do a tiny bit of networking. Um, just stay on the line. You can come back at eight o'clock and we will be hearing from uh, Dr. Martin Dinov from Mind Festival. So, Hannah, if I take my screen off, you should be able to uh, hopefully put a cocktail party on for us. Hello, it's me. I'm back again. Am I live? Hopefully I'm live. So, someone tell me if I'm not live. You are live. Um, again, really nice to chat with some, with some fun people. Um, and I am absolutely delighted to announce our first speaker for tonight. And, and I don't want to give too much of an introduction um, because I know he's going to do it himself. But our first speaker is going to be Dr. Martin Dinov of, of Mind. Um, Mind is an incredible, hello, he's, he's popping up and popping down, um, is an incredible uh, London-based, so represent London, um, neurotech startup that is tackling the huge problem of sort of mental health and, and cognitive health and well-being um, using a combination of sort of BCIs and cool technology um, and, and sort of smartphones and, and apps and technology along those lines. Um, so we will be taking questions during this talk. Um, and, and I know some people have sent some already and you can send them on the chat here or you can send them to me on Slack. Um, so what I'm going to do now is hand over to Martin. Martin, if you want to pop your screen up, um, and we will look forward to catching yeah. up in a second. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me, and just let me know when you can see my screen. Should be visible now, hopefully. Can yeah, you see my screen? Can. I guess you can. It's up there. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So just going to go through a few slides. Um, but kind of before I start, maybe just introduce myself. So um, I guess kind of the perspective I bring is I'm a kind of a coder and technologist at heart. Started coding when I was seven. Got into machine learning, neural nets, kind of before the GPUs, you know, 2011, 20, before 2011, 2012. Um, so I've always been kind of software and AI person. Then eventually I did um, my PhD at Imperial. Um, worked on um, neurofeedback, BCIs, um, mostly EEG based, it's some fMRI stuff, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so worked on kind of neurofeedback, BCIs, and if, if eventually kind of towards the end of my PhD, I realized I, I, this is really cool, and obviously we're all very excited with neurotechnology, but I want to bring this to the real world and at scale, and doing that with BCI headsets, at least for now, is not really possible, right? So that's kind of the motivation and kind of a little bit about my background, why I started this company, uh, Mind. Uh, and our focus and kind of mission is to improve mental well-being, as Sophie mentioned, um, through neuroadaptive personalization. Um, so just a small disclaimer that I've stolen some images in the beginning of the presentation. And it's um, I, I don't mean to promote or discourage any particular product or technology. It's, it's kind of an academic uh, talk, right? Um, and it's kind of just my opinions. So maybe let's take a step back just for a moment uh, and kind of talk about what is neurotechnology. And uh, it, it might seem obvious that this is neurotechnology, right? Neuralink, uh, and, and it is. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's invasive, though, and it's not really ready for prime time in, in any real sense yet. Then you have all the consumer EEG headsets, which... Um, which Ben was talking about earlier as well, and uh, you know they, they're they're cool, and I you know we've we've a lot of us here have probably play with a lot of these, um, and they're ready for prime time in the sense that you can buy them. But um, well, this is not really a consumer headset here in the middle, but um, you know they're they're not really convenient. Um, they are they are some of them are still quite pricey, and uh, actually using them in the real world is not exactly trivial, right? Unless you know what you're doing. Even then, it's not really trivial because you have like movement artifacts and so on. Then, on the uh, and then moving a little bit away from the neural signals, you have um, you have all these wearables now, including Apple Watch, that can actually measure heart rate variability, and that gives you kind of a sense of the autonomic nervous system's uh, activity, right? And um, there's different. Actually, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a in a second. 
Then uh, you have something like speech recognition, uh, speech-based emotion recognition, or kind of SER, speech emotion recognition. Is that neurotechnology? And um, it's probably it's probably too far removed from the neural signals to be considered neurotechnology, but that's fine because it's actually uh, many of these things um, actually uh, give you a more direct and interpretable measure of the psychological state of a person than your neural signals can with a lot of these headsets, at least in a real world setting. And so rather than talk about neurotechnology, what I'm really excited about is actually neuroadaptivity, right? So um, in case you don't know uh, kind of what this term means, a neuroadaptive system is one that continuously measures uh, your neural state, maybe, but also possibly your psychological state, physiological state, cognitive state. And then um, using that is, is kind of closing the loop and, and giving you some kind of feedback or content that's, um, that's adjusted based on your current, uh, right? let's call it neural state or mental state. But it doesn't have to be just with neural signals. Right. And by doing this, by closing the loop, which, you know, some of you will obviously know about, you can uh, you can have far more effective interventions um, for, let's say, uh, improving attention or uh, decreasing stress or whatever the application may be. Um, so if we look at uh, kind of different ways to do neuroadaptivity, you have computer vision approaches, which actually work pretty well for emotion recognition, for example. Uh, that, that's something quite well developed. Then you have variants of uh, standard computer vision with like thermal imaging. Uh, there's been some interesting research there. Then there's quite a bit of research in heart rate variability. Um, this is an app you can run on your on your Android phone. There's different ways to analyze the signal, uh, of course. And then you have galvanic skin response. You have um, eye trackers. This is a Toby eye tracker, which is you know quite affordable as well. And then you have your voice, right? You can speak and that there's a lot of information and actually um, speech and motion recognition works pretty well from that. And just very briefly, I'm, I'm trying to keep this uh, as a mostly non-technical talk, but um, just three quick references. So the first one is, um, is a study where they looked at um, they looked at computer vision and EEG features for emotion recognition. And in that particular data set, they found that CV reached, uh, you know, 74.3 accuracy on the day, on the test set with four, uh, four discrete emotions that they were classifying for of the basic emotions, EEG based. Um, so they, 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 they were, I think they were enlisting emotions in this one. Uh, I might be mixing up. I think in here they were enlisting emotions with, with some kind of protocol. And uh, computer vision was actually more accurate than EEG features. But then if you combine the two, you got a higher score, right? And this kind of multimodal or data fusion approach tends to often produce the, the best results, right? Uh, and then this, this nice, uh, these two are quite nice reviews, actually. This one looked at EEG and uh, computer vision facial expressions again. And it's more or less a similar story that uh, computer vision will produce either slightly better or pretty similar results as EEG. And generally the combined approach, actually always, just about always the combined approach tends to work best. This one here looked at speech and motion recognition and computer vision. Uh, it, it was another review paper. And you see that, you, you again, you know, this, like I have to qualify, qualify this, um, but you know it really depends on the data set you're looking at when you're talking about accuracy, obviously. But but the point is that you can get very high, in many cases, higher accuracy than you can with, um, let's say, with EEG for emotion classification, for example. So kind of so what? Well, the point is that many signals are much easier to actually measure and interpret in real world setting, much easier than than actual neural measurements, right? So like EEG, FNIRS, fMRI, and so on. Um, and so you can do a lot of very cool neuroadaptive applications without actually relying fully on, on you know, uh, neural signals. So what we're building uh, at Mind, what we've built actually so far is um, this neuroadaptive multimodal voice middleware. It's a software. And it does a couple of things, and I won't go into full detail on all of it, but uh, it does real-time emotion and stress tracking from uh, either just speech or just wearables. Uh, we've integrated many of the consumer wearables. I, I, I would say most, maybe. Um, it does attention and fatigue tracking from EEG. It takes, uh, it uses environmental and behavioral signals for um, improving emotional and stress prediction, uh, different kinds of signals. Um, it's, it's a scalable infrastructure and you can integrate into it uh, through an API that's available, though not yet publicly. 
And uh, one important point is that we do the speech and motion recognition in particular uh, in a privacy preserving way. So that's, um, I can kind of talk more about that if, um, if there's questions, what kind of what that means. But basically we don't look at um, the words that are being said. We do this in a yeah privacy preserving way. Um, yeah. Uh, and and then the final kind of point is that we have these neuroadaptively targeted uh, well-being suggestions or recommendations on the back of the state of the person, right, uh, in real time. And we we have a couple of things in development like fatigue tracking and attention tracking from speech, which are not really quite ready yet. Um, and it's kind of the same thing again, uh, just shown that we have this API that you can integrate uh, into for the middleware. Uh, you can also, there, there's actually an app into app integration uh, as well um, that we've been working on uh, that I think I'll mention in, in a moment again. Uh, you have these new adaptive algorithms, um, as I mentioned, privacy preserving, and we've actually trained uh, in, in many, for many of the algorithms, we've trained in multimodally, uh, which has been quite useful for getting uh, higher accuracy uh, in, in some cases. So, you know, the problem we're trying to solve is, um, is that mental well-being and mental health is, uh, it's actually going downhill. It's a massive cost in the global economy. Uh, it affects performance, productivity. It's uh, driven especially by millennials and Gen Z. And actually the problem is getting worse year by year. Um, and, and it's just really, really bad. And the part of the, part of the issue is that Current solutions are not very, uh, they're not very good in short. Uh, and part of the reason is they're not very personalized. They're not very engaging and they're not as effective as they can be. And our kind of thesis of mine is that the, the, the reason they're not is that uh, they lack usually measurement and they're not really neuroadaptive to the person. Uh, and so kind of as a company where we're build, trying to build these neuroadaptive experiences in a couple of different settings uh, that I'm showing here, our main focus right now is um, mobility and cars. We were looking at some of these other ones uh, and there's a couple of exciting things we'll be announcing soon, in particular in this space actually with uh, smart cars. Um, we've been working on some very cool projects and we're doing this press release in, a, in like two weeks. Um, I, I can't really talk more about it now, but the idea is uh, what we're what we're working on is to bring neuroadaptive well-being uh, focused experiences in everyday settings where people spend the most time. And so why cars? Well, I'll kind of start with the last point here. We spend a lot of time on the move. Now, not everyone drives, but many people do. And the, the in-car setting is nicely constrained. And, um, you, you know, it's it's uh, it's one of the places where we spend a lot of time, and the other places kind of are respectively, you know, in the home and at work, and that kind of covers a lot of a lot of life. You know, if you're at home, you're at work or in the car, um, and and the idea is to have um, this well-being support, uh, well-being experiences that are personalized through neuroadaptivity. And our deployment roadmap is we're now deploying this in cars. Uh, and mobility settings, then we'll have a more public launch of the middleware. We've already done some API, um, you know, deployments and, and kind of integrations, but we'll have a more public launch um, so people can just, yeah, use it uh, as they see fit. Uh, and then um, home entertainment, smart homes after that, workplace well-being soon after, and something we're very excited about is space in the defense industry where there's obvious applications. Um, and our vision kind of at a high level is to embed ubiquitous, highly personalized mental well-being support for everyone all the time, everywhere. And I, I can't stress this enough. You know, I'm really excited by BCI and EEG and so on and all, all this neurotechnology stuff, but it's not really ready for real world usage at scale, right? And so what we're kind of trying to bridge that gap by focusing on speech and other wearables that are more developed, more widespread right now, and uh, kind of trying to bridge, a, build a bridge on until the more, um, you know, the things that we've just been talking about, uh, let's say EEG or F near space device until they're kind of re really ready for prime time. Um, so thank you very much for your time and attention. Happy to Amazing. take some questions uh, if there are. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and I have had, uh, we've had some shy questioners. So they've, they've mostly come in on Slack, but we do have one question that came up on this event, which was, um, will your slides be available? Quick one uh, to get out of Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Super, that's great. Thank you. We'll make sure that we share those through Slack. Um, that was absolutely fascinating, um, Martin. Really, really interesting to hear what you're up to. And, and I'm really interested to hear more about the smart cars thing, but appreciate that that's something that, that can't be shared just yet. Sure. Thanks um, for inviting me. Yeah. 
Thank awesome. You. Yeah, it's, it's been great to have you. Um, cool. So we've got a, a few different questions that have have come up. Um, so I think probably the first, a good question to start with would be, what do you see as the biggest challenges to using sort of technology to support people's mental health, as opposed to things like um, therapy that might be a little bit easier to personalize? Um, pr probably uh, not having a, a fully automated solution where you don't know why something's being recommended to you, right? Uh, and I think that's where somewhere something like explainable machine learning can uh, can come in, where you kind of give the the reasons for why something's recommended. I think that's quite important, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. You don't um, want to just blindly follow suggestions. I'm not sure that's uh, that's going to get us there. Like, yeah. hey, do this, you'll feel better. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. Um, super. And we, we had one question that came in while you were talking about um, kind of facial uh, emotion recognition. Um, but actually, I think it maybe applies to the sort of wider product. Um, do you find that there are sort of really big interpersonal differences, either in terms of kind of emotion recognition or kind of via the face or, or via voice? So does it work really well for people who might be have a really kind of smiley and enthusiastic voice versus people who are a little bit um, more monotonous? Uh, you know, it, it does differ, and we, we, we get this question quite a bit, and uh, I, I think the most, it, it does differ between people, it also differs between cultures, and, and the, the short answer is, you know, you it takes time to optimize it for different settings to get enough data. Uh, I would say right now, uh, the way, like most of our data is focused on, let's call it, um, Europeans and like North Americans probably, like ra rather than, let's say, um, maybe like Asian speakers or, yeah. Um, it, it's definitely a factor though. It's definitely a factor, uh, absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's always a bit of a challenge when you're developing a product that you have to start somewhere. Um, yeah. So kind of, you know, having as diverse data as possible is really important, but kind of getting it right for the first group would be super. Um, great. So we've also got a question that I think is super topical, um, and, and this has been something that's been huge across the past, well, since March. What do you think COVID is going to do, or what has COVID been doing for the sort of development and adoption of, of kind of really cutting edge products to support people's mental health? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure. Like, uh, obviously, there's a lot of... Um... There's there's a, there's a lot of new and interesting uh, products out there from from the UK from the US. Um, I mean I mean I can give a lot of examples, but one in particular I think they're pretty sure they're UK based is Sensate, uh, w which is like a it's a vagus nerve kind of stimulation device, uh, and there's also all sorts of stuff like that. But I th I think they haven't really um, broken through to the mass mark, and I don't mean them. I mean more cutting edge approaches haven't really broken through to the mass market yet, right? Uh, I don't think we've seen that. Uh, there's a lot of talk of like mental health and mental well-being, um, and, and that's great. I think a lot of the approaches are still like coaching based, a, a lot of it, like coaching and, and human based, which is fine. But there's a lot of technical approaches, obviously, that you can that you can use as well. Um, I, can, I guess it takes time to once you develop something, it takes time to also uh, kind of get it more widespread, right? I think scalability is, is always going to be a challenge. Um, we've just had another question or a sort of a statement pop up in the chat um, from Sean, um, who's mentioned that they work in space and defense and would love to learn more. I know you had a reference about kind of how your products might be used in that space. Are, are you able to tell us anything further on that? Um, we, we, well, okay, so we're exploring something right now, uh, trying to get something off the ground with the uh, UK uh, MLD uh, guys, um, which would be... Um, well, it would be very cool. It would be a very cool and, and important, I think, use case. More than cool, it would be a, a good use case. It's well being focused again. Um, so ha happy to talk. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what else to say. Like our, our focus as a company is is mental well being, right? Like we're um, when I say like space or defense or automotive, it's it's always the same focus. We want to, like I said, it, 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 that that is very much a mission, right? Just have. The, uh, or, or even like uh, digital entertainment and gaming. Um, why, like you can you can uh, play on your PlayStation or listen to some music, but you could have a secondary effect other than just entertainment, right? You could actually it could help you de-stress or feel better uh, in kind of a quantify quantifiable and measurable way. So it's um, it, it's the, even in space and defense that's kind of the focus for us. Yeah, yeah, that's really fascinating. No, I think I know that you guys have got maybe kind of more news and exciting things coming out this year. So I guess that's one to watch. 
that does um, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. So uh, one question's just come in from Sarah, who was keen to know whether the sort of main purpose for your technology is for kind of diagnosis and for helping people understand their well-being, um, or also or separately for kind of treatment and, and helping people have better well-being through use of the product. Yeah, more the latter. So, so we're not focused on healthcare and clinical applications. It's more um, uh, we're we're more fo focused on kind of uh, scaling it in everyday use cases. So it, that's why we're calling it well-being rather than healthcare. Or it, it's not clinical applications for now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I work in the healthcare space, and if you can make anything a wellness product, do because if you don't, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah, that's just yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Right, time for just one more question. Uh, so you mentioned preserving privacy by a speech, and I know that this is a really big topic from the ethical side in neurotech in terms of, you know, we build all of these new technologies and we get excited about them, but sometimes we forget to look back and think about how do we build something that protects people's privacy. Um, so I was really interested to know sort of how you kind of maintain people's privacy by a speech. Um, is there a risk that someone might accidentally talk about their PIN number or their voice might be identified? What's your guys' approach to Okay, so the the first thing that we um, that we've kind of been doing from the from the start is to not look, we we told ourselves let's not look at the content. Uh, so, so when you're doing speech and motion recognition, you could look at the text or kind of the words that are said, right? Um, and that's one of the things we're not looking for is we extract features and in a irreversible way, so you can't go back to the original time series. Um, speech right uh and and that's that's kind of nice because you have a kind of a provable one-way uh feature extraction which you use for your emotion prediction and so yeah that's that's um that, that's the one point and the other point is um we're, we're just building up um one type of privacy preserving machine learning with uh so where you know you it's encryption based in short got it got it always a good buzzword to hear um, brilliant. So I think I'm going to have to hand over to our next speaker in just a second. But Martin, sure. thank you so much for talking. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. We'll share Martin's uh, slides a little bit later, and I'll hand over to Ben, um, who is going to introduce. Thank you, Sophie, and uh, thank you, Martin, for that talk. It was excellent. Um, yeah, so it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor George Maliaris. Uh, George is Professor of Technology at the University of Cambridge, um, where he works on all kinds of technologies, um, some of them being uh, neural interfacing technologies. Uh, I hope you won't mind me saying, George, that uh, he has many years of experience in researching organic electronic interfaces. Uh, and I can attest from experience, he's a wonderful mentor and uh, many of his students and postdocs have gone on to become experts in the field of brain interfacing and um, all, kinds of, all, all kinds of areas, George, I'm sure you'll say more. And I'm glad you brought the parrot today. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Very kind introduction, and I appreciate the invitation uh, very much. Hi, all. I'm George Maliaras. I normally don't look like a pirate, but uh, I had eye surgery a couple of days ago, and I thought I'll go for the look. So let me uh, load my slides really quick. Um, should be a button here. Share screen. Yay. That should do it. So can you see my slides? Yeah. We Wonderful. So uh, in lack of a better uh, title, Neurotech Stories from the Past and the Future, I'll tell you about something that worked in the past and hopefully something that will work in the future. So I guess we're all here because we get excited when we see demonstrations such as this one. This is deep brain stimulation for tremor. With a flick of a switch, you have a major amelioration in the condition of this patient. And um, this technology is moving now beyond just motor disorders into neuropsychiatric disorders and things such as obesity, Crohn's disease, and, and so on and so forth. So super exciting. Uh, what's the catch? There are some severe limitations in what is known as bioelectronic medicine, first and foremost, is we do not understand how the brain works. It's a very complex machine, consists of over 80 billion neurons in, uh, in, in humans. And although we understand how neurons fire action potentials and communicate with each other, um, we do not understand how we go from this communication between the components, neurons, 
to macroscopic behavior. And to do that, um, electrophysiology plays a very uh, big part uh, through configurations such as electroencephalography with uh, cutaneous uh, scalp electrode, corticography with uh, electrodes sitting on the brain, and penetrating probes. Um, neuroscientists are trying to understand uh, uh, how the brain works and address this question. A follow-up question is what is the mechanism of neuromodulation when you start modulating, when you start injecting current from this uh, electrode, what exactly happens to neurons and their communication? Now, this type of fundamental limitation in our understanding goes hand in hand with technological limitation. Um, the signals that uh, uh, are to be measured are small and diverse, not only um, a, a small ionic uh, signals, but more complex signals that we would like to know is uh, uh, relate to what happens to local metabolic activity, um, what happens uh, if you are coupling light with the brain, and so on and so forth. The environment is hostile to electronics. When you stick a probe into the brain, it's bad for the brain and for the probe. Uh, the uh, cerebrospinal fluid is highly corrosive to some electronic material. And in principle, when you do invasive electronics, um, multiple surgeries are required to replace batteries and often to adjust the uh, uh, position of, of leads. So um, these technological limitations um, necessitate that new technologies are being developed in order to help us understand how the brain works and promote uh, bioelectronic medicine, bring it to patients at scale. So how do we think about this? How do we think about technology? One way to think of it is as, as an exercise in bridging differences. For example, if you look at the properties of biological systems, the properties of the brain is soft, uh, squishy, um, the uh, communication between its components is very complex with signals ranging from small metal ions to larger biomolecules, even to components of cells being exchanged. And it's also a dynamic system. Its chemistry changes as you go from early life into old age. While electronics in their traditional form are made out of mechanically stiff material, um, the communication in between components, say these two components, is quantitatively understood um, and, and very simple. It takes place by exchanging an electron uh, flux. And they're static. They spend their lifetime in the form factor they were fabricating in. So if, if you follow this argument, um, it is clear that as a technologist, you should try to make electronics with properties akin to biological systems. You need to make them soft mechanically. You need to teach them foreign languages so that they can communicate with ionic signals and more complex signals in the world of biology. And you need to give them dynamic properties. Now, this is only part of the story because although this type of thinking is great for guiding materials and device development, it lacks focus on the end result. So you need a higher level diagram for this. Uh, the way we tend to think about uh, bioelectronics is by a push-pull model. So within a lab like ours, you would have expertise in some flavor of electronics, maybe surface engineering, um, some other engineering and technology knowledge. And where you want to go is in the clinic uh, uh, to uh, help folks with epilepsy, brain cancer, and other conditions. Um, now, if you see this from the, uh, the side of a clinician, um, the, uh, there are needs there. There are needs to be satisfied by the technology. So this creates a technology, uh, a clinical pool, which matches the technology push, which we engineers are familiar with. So then you have to establish a translational pipeline, consider how do I get my device to the clinic to satisfy this particular need. What is the, um, the, the sequence of steps that I need to take uh, to do that? And vice versa, you can also consider the flow of information in the reverse pathway um, as a feedback pipeline that will inform the development of technology. 
And of course, it's a complex uh, ecosystem with multiple stakeholders. You need to consider uh, the patients, uh, regulators, ethicists, industry, and so, so on and so forth. So, yeah, I believe this is a very uh, good way of thinking about uh, neurotechnology because it explicitly focuses on clinical impact. Now, as, as part of this exercise, it becomes quite uh, uh, straightforward that you need to think about um, compelling advantages in order to translate the technology to the clinic. I, this is a bit too long to, to read, but there are issues of liability and there are issues of cost associated with the introduction of new materials and new technologies to the clinic um, that make it so um, for a new technology to make it to the clinic, there has to be a compelling advantage. It doesn't, it, it means that if, you, if your device, your technology is only 10% better, chances are it's not gonna see the light of day. You need to be able to do something that cannot be done otherwise, or that you do it so much better than the competition. So let me show you one example of this uh, in what is called the NeuroGrid. This is, arising from a clinical need to map the brain at higher resolution. So this is a cortical array placed on the brain. This is the, the standard array that you find in the clinic. It has fairly large electrodes. And the reason for that is that signals that emanate at the surface of the brain are fairly weak. So in order to enable higher resolution uh, uh, maps, you need to look into the fundamentals and the coupling between ionic signal in uh, an, an electrolyte, the cerebrospinal fluid, and they're coupling with electronic charges in a semiconductor or an electronic material. Now, if you try to do this in silicon, if you try to couple ions with uh, electronic charges in silicon, you find that you have a barrier, typically a nitride or an oxide that separates the two charges and decreases their interaction. So most people would use noble metals such as platinum iridium to make electrodes um, where you have a barrier free interface but still the coupling between electronics and ionics is fairly limited uh, because you have charges of ionic nature in one side and electronic charges on the other side forming a double air capacitor and that has just a, a, a limiting degree of coupling if you were to use materials, and never mind the details here, materials in which ions can penetrate in, then you would arrive in a situation that's illustrated here, where you now have an electrode that couples in a volumetric fashion ionics and electronics and enhances their coupling. So you have much higher coupling between the two types of charges. Um, and that allows you to make devices with state-of-the-art performance. Now, without getting into the details, into the details, uh, there is a material called P.PSS that allows this volumetric uh, coupling. It's a conducting polymer. This is manifested by a capacitor that scales linearly as the volume of this electrode. And it means that if you have just a film of 130 nanometers thick, you have 100 times larger coupling between ionics and electronics. This means now that you can make your electrode 100 times smaller and still be able to record with the same uh, fidelity. And this is what we did here. We made very small electrodes, coupled them with uh, flexible conformal uh, substrate so that they could conform with uh, the radii of curvature that you find in the brain. Here they're shown on an orchid uh, leaf. And when these were placed on the uh, cortex of a rat, we were able to see single neuron uh, activity, something that was not observed before from the cortex because simply the signals were too low and electrodes needed to be uh, too big. So by, by engineering a better coupling between um, the, the language of electronics and the language of uh, neurons, we were able to gain uh, in, in resolution, in spatial resolution. And that's a major advantage, it's a compelling advantage that enabled the translation of this technology in humans. So this is now used in uh, hospitals in the US to map the human brain at uh, unprecedented uh, resolution. 
So now a bit about the future, where, where would this uh, uh, research go? So one of the uh, directions that could benefit from new technology is uh, making less invasive pain stimulators. So in the world of uh, pain uh, uh, stimulators, or stimulators to counteract pain, um, you have this puddle electrodes that work wonderfully well. These are placed on the spinal cord, but they require a laminectomy to, uh, uh, before they can be placed on the, on the spinal cord. And it is quite a brutal uh, procedure. You also have this uh, um, linear arrays that can be placed on the spinal cord through a spinal tap, a much gentler uh, procedure. However, they tend to not work as well as the paddles. They can shift around. So ideally, you want a device that can be placed as easily as a linear array, but perform as a paddle electrode. So here, inspiration came from uh, the, the world of soft robotics, uh, when you see demonstrations like this, where you change the shape of an object by pneumatic uh, actuation, then the, the brain starts uh, running with, uh, away with ideas. And here's one of the, uh, the ideas, is to make an implant that has pneumatically uh, actuated fluidics um, and can change shape. So you could imagine uh, rolling the implant and then unrolling it axially from here, or rolling it in this fashion and then uh, expanding it on a paddle. So this is shown here. This is a paddle electrode when it's unrolled, but it can be rolled up and inserted in the spinal cord through a, a to a, a needle. This is in an in vitro model showing how it would deploy. And this is now in a, a cadaveric, a human cadaveric model. The implant is, is placed in. There are two markers at the top and bottom part of the implant that originally are aligned. And then you actuate pneumatically and you deploy the, the implant and form a nice paddle electrode on the uh, spinal cord. So we believe that these are technologies that can help a lot of people. They can help uh, address neurological disorders and human disease in general. Um, a way to think about this is in uh, terms of a science and technology push meeting a clinical pool. Um, that's a good model because it focuses on, on impact. There are compelling advantages that need to be achieved to translate uh, new technology to the clinic. I gave you the example of NeuroGrid. And we hope that um, uh, another uh, technology to be uh, translated soon to the clinic is devices that change shape through pneumatic activation. So with that, let me thank the, the group, uh, collaborators and funding agencies and thank you very much for your uh, attention and, and for the opportunity to, to speak. I really enjoyed the meeting so far. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, George. Um, I think that was really interesting. I think that'll be a great primer for people that are interested in this uh, field and the invasive side of things as well. Um, guys, if you have any more questions, please put them in the, the comments box. George, we have a few questions here. Um, I guess more general questions. We have a lot of people from um, who are kind of students on the call and, and high school students as well. One of the questions here is for people looking to work in Eurotech, in academia, I guess, or industry as well would be relevant. Um, do you think you need to be an expert in coding or neuroscience or engineering or psychology? I guess this list goes on. Yeah, well, it's a wonderful field because everybody is welcome. Um, in my lab, we have people with a background in science, physics, chemistry, background in engineering, background in uh, 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 life sciences, um, and clinicians. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful environment. All are welcome. No one has the uh, complete picture. And it's just being able to uh, work with others, being willing to reach out and learn new languages and all that is, is very important. Thank you. Um, another question here. I, I, it probably ties into your, your comment on pushing and pulling, uh, George. And I, I think, um, I, think I, I assume this would come up um, on the topic of Neuralink. Um, somebody asks, what do you think about um, Elon Musk's Neuralink trying to develop interfaces with a, with a focus on engineering, really going engineering first rather than uh, neuroscience or clinically led, perhaps? Mm -hmm. 
I think the, there is need, it is clear that there is need for better interfaces. I would uh, dare say that despite the fact that we do not understand how the brain works, we are limited by technology. So having a technology focus is, is, is a wonderful thing. Look, it's, it's a trade-off. You need to attack from both sides. Having a lot of money all of a sudden drop on the engineering side is, is a good thing. It's going to push the equilibrium a bit more towards needing to understand the brain. Thank you. There's a question there from uh, Martin as well, George. Um, what's the safety profile on these devices of electrodes that you've been speaking about? And more broadly, what do you think is the safest long-term implantable electrode material? What do you think that's going to be? I think that the jury is still out on that. Um, there is unfortunately not much in terms of uh, long-term safety of thin film technologies. Uh, it's still rather new. So one thing that I didn't mention is current neurotech that uh, exists in the clinic is made by hand. It's it's very manual, very crude. If you look into cochlear implants, for example, they haven't changed in form factor since they were first invented in late 60s. Um, the, the industry is about to undergo a transition to thin film. So the, the, uh, the uh, processes and technology of the semiconductor industry, which is wonderful because you can access higher, higher resolution, higher fidelity, um, make it make mass production so uh, many many advantages however the safety profile isn't yet established um, and one of the things that is really missing is a platform for accelerated testing of materials in vitro not a lot of people have the patience to implant uh, a bunch of rats and wait for two years to do histology uh, certainly it's very difficult to fund and um, uh, very difficult to publish uh, later in a high impact journal. So that, that pushes people to uh, pursue more immediately rewarding type of work. Um, so a, a platform that would allow to accelerate uh, screening of materials would be extremely desirable. I think it's interesting in the conversation we were having with uh, Tim Dennison before, George, uh, about how um, yeah. you'll, you'll reach a threshold where you need to start exploring these uh, these materials, these technologies more, because the, the, the benefit will be so much greater than the risk that there is yeah. currently. Indeed. Uh, so there's another question here. Um, can the volumetric electrodes also be used for stimulation uh, yeah. in the electrode size? It's the same property that makes an electrode a good uh, recording electrode that makes it also a good stimulation electrode. It's having a high capacitance, means that when you inject the current pulse, the uh, voltage, uh, the interface doesn't overshoot. That's great. I guess maybe time for one more question, George. Um, could you give one piece of advice um, to a high school student who wants to get into research and develop neurotech? Yeah, so pick any field, whether that is engineering or science or uh, uh, life science, neuroscience, whatever, surgery, get good at it and then take a turn towards the other direction, towards right. engineering if you're a clinician or towards the clinic if you're an engineer. I think that's a good answer. Thank you again, George, for a wonderful talk. Um, Thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to have you here. Sophie, um, I believe we're, we're going into a little bit more networking now. Is that correct? She will pop up, I'm sure. Uh, I will absolutely try to pop up. Hi. Yes, absolutely. So we've, we've got, for those who are able to stay on, I've just been brought my dinner, so I'm, I'm all taken care of. Um, but for those who are able to stay on, we would love to do some more networking with you. Um, for those who do need to hop off, um, maybe if we just bring all of the speakers really quickly and all of the hosts, if you just want to turn on your cameras really quickly so that we can we can wave goodbye and say thank you to everyone who's helped make this event so fantastic. So we've got a huge number of us. There we are. Everyone's on the uh, on the screen. Um, so a huge thank you from me. My name is Sophie Valentine, uh, chapter lead of the, the London chapter. Do reach out if you want to chat, get in touch. Um, but ben, I'll, I'll let you sort of say goodbye from your side. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been lovely. Please, I echo Sophie's comments. Please reach out if you're interested in anything or uh, the work we do in the lab, of course. I'm happy to speak with people. Hannah? Uh, 
<laughs> Same again. <laughs> um, yeah, great, great to have so many of you with us here today. Um, really enjoyed uh, today's session and do feel free to reach out if you want to continue the conversation. Yeah, and just again, just to echo what everyone else has said, um, more than happy to speak to anyone, especially if there's any uh, students thinking about uh, which uh, kind of discipline they're wanting to, to follow. Um, I'm one who has started to change their disciplines from, from medicine into engineering. Uh, I'm quite happy to speak to anyone who is uh, interested in jumping ship, as it were. Brilliant. Martin, any final? No, just awesome event. Thanks. <laughs> Anything from you, John? Yeah, no, same thing. Same thing here. Great event. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much for joining and, and thank you both um, and thank you everyone for, for all of your contributions to the event and thank you everyone for coming. We really hope you've enjoyed it. As mentioned, for those who can stay on, we will be doing a little bit more networking. Um, so I will take my screen down last couple of seconds just to grab our Twitter handles. Do follow us, do get in touch and stay in touch. Um, and I will hand over to Hannah, um, who will be able to put on just a couple of rounds of networking for us to round off the evening for those who can stay. Um, but a huge thank you for coming, everyone, and stay safe. Thank <laughs> you.